Have you been out to a restaurant and found yourself disappointed or even angry that you did not get to one of the tables with a view? Maybe there was an important meeting in which your chair ended up almost off to the side, nowhere near the action, and you would much prefer a more prominent seat. If you've been to a child's birthday party lately, you might have seen this played out in a more visible way. When the birthday boy or girl sits down at the table and they're ready to blow out that candle, and all of a sudden there's a great rush for the seats next to the guest of honor and the upset faces on the children who were not able to get those coveted chairs. This all seems like everyday, no big deal feelings that most of us can see within ourselves. But in our gospel passage today, Jesus asks us to check our motivations and to rethink the elevated statuses in which we try to place ourselves at parties, at dinner, and I'd venture to say in life. Hear now a reading of the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 14, verses 1 and verses 7 through 14. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinct, distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repay repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Once again, we are looking at an event that occurred on Sabbath. This time, Jesus is heading to a dinner party. The Pharisees are still watching Jesus very closely, and as usual, he's about to step on their toes. But here's the thing. He's probably going to step on our toes here as well. After observing for a while, he offers two sets of rules. Table etiquette, if you will. Etiquette for both guests at a feast and the hosting party. The main portion of our text is focused on how guests should act when attending a party or an event. Jesus is retelling in these verses, Proverbs 25, verses 6 and 7. So let's listen to the message version of those verses. Don't work yourself into the spotlight. Don't push yourself into this place of prominence. It is better to be promoted to a place of honor than face humiliation by being demoted. This was countercultural then, and it is countercultural now. We're taught to put ourselves out there. To own the room is to succeed. Now these things are not intrinsically bad, but what I think he's saying here is to approach it with some humility. 
our society could use a really big dose of humility, and Jesus is calling us to it. If nothing else, it is practical advice that might just save us from getting embarrassed. But does Jesus really care where we sit? I think that Jesus cares that we think about others and that our ambitions or our egos do not create situations where we have forgotten to think of those around us, and especially when we don't care about anything but our own gain. Tom Wright, author of Luke for Everyone, points out that the first part of our passage has more to do than just social advice. It's also meant to bring light to the way that people were jostling for position in the eyes of God. It doesn't matter our wealth, our social standing, our education. None of that reflects our worth in God's eyes. The lack of any of these also is not a reflection of our worth. Jesus was telling the Pharisees that they were no more important to God than anyone else and to quit living their lives as if they were. Certainly a a difficult message for the scholars and religious leaders of that day. Now sometimes the modern church lives out its ministry in a way that reflects that we have not quite learned our lesson from this parable. When what we do as churches focus more on our wants, our needs, and our comforts, and less on the needs of those around us, I think that we start to walk dangerously close to the Pharisees. The next part of the passage, though, helps to keep us from this pitfall. It's the etiquette concerning hosts and how they should offer hospitality. Then he turned to the host The next time you put on a dinner, don't just invite your friends and family and rich neighbors, the kind of people who will return the favor. Invite some people that never get out, the misfits from the wrong side of the tracks. You'll be and you will experience a blessing. They won't be able to return the favor, but the favor will be returned. Oh, how it will be returned at the resurrection of God's people. Charles E. Raynal in the Feasting on the Word Commentary writes that Karl Barth interprets this passage as a special kind of hospitality that is found in fellowship and an important com- component of Christian community. Barth goes on to say that when the community acts to establish fellowship, it witnesses to God's fellowship established in Jesus Christ, both between the whole world and God among human beings. The community of God's people, he says, would be mortally sick if it were to identify with the wants, needs, ethos of a certain class and to build itself around the preservation of that class. God's people includes all people. Galatians 3, 28 and 29 tells us that in Christ's family, there can be no division into Jews or non-Jews, slave and free, male and female. Among us, you are all equal. That is, we are all in common relationship with Jesus Christ. Also, these verses go on to say, Since you are Christ's family, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the covenantal promises. Many of us in this room have lived very fortunate lives, not without pain and loss, but fortunate. This church is about to celebrate its 95th anniversary in a couple of months, So this church has been fortunate as well. This passage today is asking us to look outside ourselves and to be present with all God's people and to do so without hopes of any gain 
other than the joy of doing God's will. Earlier this week, I actually asked for help with this sermon on Facebook. I put out a plea asking for those who are involved in our church to share what in the past year has brought them the most excitement, fulfillment, hope, and joy. This is a question that I get asked a lot in meetings, in peer learning groups, amongst my other friends who are clergy. It's a way for us to focus on the things that are life-giving and bring purpose to our calling. It does something really great to you to be invited to focus on a positive and then share what you love about it. So here are a few of your answers. The opportunity to serve in our community. The missional focus of this church this past year. BBS and the women's retreat were popular choices, as were live nativity and trunk retreat. Several mentioned aspects of worship, like the music, sermons, children's sermons, moments of blessings. For others, the bonds that can be made through special lunches, friendships, new faces were important to them, as was feeling like this place was home. The special services like those found in Holy Week, teaching our young people, hearing little ones in worship, caroling, chaperoning, and attending youth camp, being able to make a difference in others' lives by using our giftedness, both inside our walls for spiritual education and encouragement and outside our walls as well. That's a really great list of things that people are energized by through being a part of this congregation. These are the things that I love about this church, too. Whether it's worship, fellowship, service, hospitality, these are important parts of Christian community. When we seek to find ways to open the doors further and connect with all God's people, we are on the right track. I personally, along with many of you, have been very excited about the ways that we have sought to broaden the scope of what Christian hospitality and Christian fellowship truly is. These are important to me not only as a minister of this church, a participant, but also as a mother of a child who is watching and learning how to live out his faith. So when I've been asked the question of what brings me fulfillment, excitement, joy, and hope, lately, every single time I have said our vacation Bible school this past year, I was and I still am really excited about it. One day I decided to unpack that a little bit to figure out why our time in Shimwood was so energizing to me. And I think I figured it out. If you know me, you know I love VBS. I love transforming the rooms into new and exciting destinations. I love the quick intake of breath as the children see rooms that first moment and how it can transport them directly into the theme and away from the everyday. Those are some of the things that over the past 13 years of ministry that I've thrived on. If I'm honest, I'd also say that those are some of the things that I've taken maybe a little bit too much pride in, too. If you'll remember, a couple summers ago, we even had the news people come, and they they filmed us, and they checked us out, and it was so good to get our name out into the community. Yet absolutely none of that was present at this past summer's VBS. It was held outside. There was no power, so we had no songs. I couldn't decorate it, and it was just out there on this playground with bits of trash strewn all about, yet it was special. And here's why I think it changed me so much. At first, I struggled with the fact that we wouldn't be offering it to the kids in our after school and our preschool because they need a VBS too. And I've already confessed that there's a pride issue with me and VBS. I like to work really hard on something and then kind of bask in the glow of it for a minute. That's certainly not very biblical, though, is it? 
So this year we were able to do something new. We invited a whole new set of kids to the table that we hadn't invited before. And not only did we invite them, but we took that table to them. So that it would actually be possible for them to attend. These kids latched on to the love that was shown to them, and it was obvious to me that this is a relationship that we might be called to foster. It was good for our adults. It was good for our children. Instead of focusing on how to build a set, the planners had to figure out how to get food into the bellies of hungry children. Those that were leading our crafts were thinking, well, we don't want to just have them throw it away. What can I put into their hands that can be of use, that can be used with intention? There was no room at the table, or there was room at the table for all people, but there weren't any elevated spots. We didn't rush in to save the day, but we were in it together with that community. We partnered with Alfred Johnson a man doing incredible things in our community through Greenville Church Without Walls and his dedicated volunteers. It was one of the most meaningful things that I've ever been a part of. When I put my pride and my desires aside and we just let God work, it was holy ground for me. So let's commit to more of this. Think about where your passions and your gifts lie. Knowing that you cannot do it all, consider what you can do and show up in the name of a God who loves people and calls us to serve. Let us continue to work together to find ways to offer hospitality, to invite our friends, sure, our neighbors, and those that we do not know to join us, just as the scripture today instructs us. Let's invite them to the table for conversation and for food. Tables are and have been an important part of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ and in God's story as a whole. Let us find ways to show that there is room at God's table for all who seek a place. No place is more important than the next. But it's the fellowship with God and the people of God that matters. Recently, I saw a post that said there are two things that God does with tables. God turns them and God prepares them. In just a moment, you too will be invited to come forward to God's table that has been prepared for you so that you might have the opportunity to be in fellowship with not only God, but with one another, to reflect on the love and grace that we receive because of who God is and what Jesus has done for us. Thanks be to God for this precious gift. Amen.